This is the Open University. One more thing is the famous refrain every time I finish an album and just before I plunge into the postpartum depression from said album, from the exhilaration, from the highs of said album, I have a a low, uh, and and I think I finished it and then a couple more births or maybe they're after births are produced from my (laughs) uterine imagination. And um, yikes has been no exception in that respect. There, There were not just one, but two more things. Uh, it's Columbo, isn't it? One more thing. Just one more thing, please. Oh, one more thing. Two more things became the songs Water Spout and A Little Rain. And uh, so I just thought I'd give a little description of those and then tell you about how you can order Yikes, uh, which is now a double CD, and talk about the artwork and all the stuff I usually do when I've finished an album. Um, because I know you love to be part of the creative process. Uh, it is very exciting, and that's kind of why I do it and why I release it as I'm recording, unlike most recording artists who kind of anally, retentively hold things back from you and then make you pay. Uh, I make you pay. <laughs> I make you pay during the creation. Um, so what is about started as a cover of Japan's Night Porter. Could I ever explain? Uh, Night Porter is it's a fantastic song with really sustained... Uh, beauty and then uh, the, uh, for me the climax is later on in the song is like five minutes or six minutes long and when it comes back into the chorus after an extended instrumental section um, I don't know why I thought I would either do a cover version of that or do something vaguely satiesque and um, so it started as uh, in three four time because Night Porter is a waltz um, but it ended up sounding more like something from David Sylvian's later solo career, actually, like the Brilliant Trees album. I ended up chopping up bits of, uh, there's a song called Nare, Nare Sol, who's an American-Asian um, conservatoire trained classical musician who, who has a fantastic series on YouTube uh, in which she explores the parallel worlds in which uh, a, a composer might have written something differently or might have been inspired by a whole different set of influences. Uh, or um, she t- sort of she's very good at pastiche, a bit like me in, in the pop field. She can do pastiche expertly uh, of existing composers, classical composers, and uh, so she'll she'll do um, you know what if Satie had been Debussy and you know so actually she had a piano piece where she the sort of medieval austerity of Satie was actually uh, being highlighted by by her playing it as if it was written by sort of rather late romantic French composers who put a lot of tinkling and azure into their compositions. Um, so she wants to show how it hadn't been written, how Satie had avoided all that stuff. Uh, he was a bit before them uh, as well, a few decades before them, but he was really, he had his own set of influences he was drawing on, including children's music, uh, ballads in uh, cabarets, and medieval music, and modal sort of weird scales and things. So um, I sort of chopped up her, uh, some of her tinkling, showing how Sati had not written Gymnopédie uh, and, and remade it. I don't think she would recognize herself playing in my song, Water Spout. Um, in Sea Wincy Spider Up, the Water Spout is a children's rhyme. And in the last episode, we looked into David Bowie's prediction in 1980 that the 80s would be full of these rather scary, nasty, late 19th century style children's poems about little boys having their ears cut off and of course this partly came true in the form of songs like um, Lullaby by the Cure. Um, This song also includes Who's That Ringing at My Doorbell? Little Pussycat who isn't very well, rub his little nose and a little mutton fat. That's the best cure for a sick pussycat. Um, All these children's tales but rather twisted in in this version little miss muffet who sat on a tuffet eating her curds and whey along came a spider uh incy wincy spider is it the same poem that one muffet and incy wincy maybe not uh i think they're different but they're both about spiders so we have a spider spider flesh in this song um and it's really just saying we're just people we suffer and die you know why should we fight um the usual stuff although it's slightly strange because my spider flesh creeps and crawls, all that stuff. Up the water spout is kind of a, another way of saying it's gone south, it's screwed up. Uh, life 
or the world is up the water spout. And we get in the video of Charles Trenet dancing uh, around, doing a, a kind of filmed version of Boom, his, one of his big hits along with La Mer, The Sea. Uh, Boom, I love, you know, because it's a, a fantastic, light-hearted pop song. Um, and um, I used it in Mook Bears, we've rested in Mook Bears on the Okinawa album, as I've said. Noemi joins me on the chorus. Uh, she's um, she's sort of equally bashful and um, eager to be in these songs. Uh, she's a big fan of my work, obviously, and uh, uh, she loves singing and sings very well. You know, sort of K-pop and J-pop. Usually, when I'm in the bath, <laughs> I always think, oh, she has a good voice. But uh, when she comes to actually having a microphone thrust in front of her face, it's like um, the more bashful, the bashful side comes out. So she sings quite bashfully on this in the, the backing of the chorus. It seems like there's, seems like the pre-chorus is the chorus and then you get an actual chorus. So I quite like this structure where it gets even more uh, accessible or memorable in the third section. So that was that. And often I think the latest song I've done is the best song I've done on the album. So this is a particular favorite. I, I kept shifting it further and forward in the track listing. So now I think it's a track four or five. Um, often the first five tracks are my favorites on my album. And then it's later on, I, I put other people's favorites. And then at the end, I put some doomy dismal ballads. So it's kind of a bit like that on this one, because it's got some doomy stuff about the end of the world, including this next song, the last song I wrote and recorded it, A Little Rain which started in a dream. I think I woke up and went straight to my sequencer and started making this very minimal and very short piece. Um, and it was a breezy take on sudden new threats of nuclear war from Putin. It seems to be a recurrent theme on this and even on the sleeve as we'll, we'll come to later, there's a little mushroom cloud. And um, so um, I was watching a, a video, somebody had made a compilation of the biggest hits of each year of the 20th century pretty much the whole 20th century, I think. And um, 1930s big hit was a song made popular by Eddie Cantor, who's in the video for uh, A Little Rain, and it's called Making Whoopie. Making Whoopie came later to mean having sex, but actually Eddie Cantor's song doesn't mean having sex. It's about getting married and about having a party when you get married. And actually it's a, a song, a kind of sarcastic song against marriage, against the supposed joys of marriage. And he says he wants to stay single and keep partying and all the rest of it. And um, so it's from, I think it was, a, it's either in 1928 when it was written. <clears throat> it was written by Walter Donaldson and Russ Kahn, <clears throat> but popularized by Eddie Cantor, uh, who also wrote songs himself. And um, so I used the video of that. It's actually entered the public domain in 2024. That's the topicality of this song is that it's um, <clears throat> up for grabs. You can extract parts of it and reuse it and all the rest of it without incurring any legal consequences. So um, I made it a song, a sarcastic song about uh, nuclear war. So in that sense, it uh, resembles Tom Lehrer's song. So long, Mom, I'm off to drop the bomb. I'll look for you when the war is over. An hour and a half from now. Because nuclear war is has the virtue of being very quick. That Tom Lehrer song might have been influenced by Brecht and Eisler's song, Song of a German Mother, which came from 1942. At least the lyric was written in 1942, so written before the conclusion of the Second World War. And um, it's a mother saying to her Nazi son, I saw you wearing your brown shirt. I should have protested aloud, for I didn't know what I now know. It was your burial shroud. I saw you wearing your brown shirt. Should have protested aloud, for I did not know what I now know. It was your burial. And it also describes Germany being decimated essentially by the war, by Hitler's war. Um, so in 1942, this was looking looking forward, a correct prediction. It was a correct prediction of the outcome and of the grief of widows that the war would create on both sides, but on the German side notably, because the propaganda obviously was not stressing that at the time. So my song, um, it's uh, 
yeah, it's just saying, <laughs> the narrator is <clears throat> shrugging it off and just saying, because we're in a way, we're, especially people my age, we're kind of blasé. I was two when the Cuban Missile Crisis happened. Then in the 80s, there was Sting writing that song, the Russians, uh, if the Russians have their children, love their children too, then uh, they won't fire those missiles. David Bowie saying, um, shoot some of those missiles in Fantastic Voyage. Think of us as fatherless scum. <laughs> Shoot some of those missiles Think of us as father and scum It won't be forgotten Cause we'll never say anything nice again There was a whole genre of um, anxiety about nuclear war songs So in a sense I'm, I'm blasé about it And I'm just like yeah yeah You know people have been threatening and scaring us Newspaper headlines recently saying, you know, is there a, or vlogs or whatever, is there a new threat, a nuclear threat on the horizon? Are we at the most dangerous nuclear time in, you know, 20, 30 years, whatever? So possibly we are, but um, it just all rides on that, the madman thesis of, is someone crazy enough to actually bring about the end of civilization as we know it? So a little rain, into every life a little rain might, must fall, is the expression. <laughs> in the case of my song, it's heavy rain and it's a nuclear fallout. And, um, but it's um, breezy, and this is what you notice about songs made in war, is that they're often very chirpy and breezy and cheerful, because people need, of course, they need cheering up at those stressful and anxiety-making and scary times. <clears throat> so that's how my album ends in terms of the recordings. And um, for the sleeve, I just uh, was on the Metro on Sunday and um, I saw a, a mural, very 80s, maybe it's not 80s, it might be 60s, but it's like, it was a slightly shabby mural, but full of geometric shapes created by tiles, which have very simple, often diagonal divisions on them. So creating perspective, creating a sort of trompe l'oeil of a landscape with buildings and the sea and um, light and shade. Um, so I just added a little sort of pixelated mushroom cloud on the horizon, as in, say, Let's Dance, the video for Let's Dance uh, by Bowie. Um, he, he sort of, with electronic trickery, put a mushroom cloud just beyond the Aboriginals. Started with this, just building up an, a composition with um, squares, and then um, I just kept adding things, a little figure of myself in a kind of lodgeresque, Bowie lodgeresque pose, kind of spread out as if I'd been blown away by the explosion, the force of the blast. And um, so it's a, a bit like Athenian 2021's album where I saw something on the wall. Actually, it was something in Osaka, although I was living in Athens. I went back to an image I'd found in Osaka and photographed, which was a ramen um sign you know these quirky details which are part of Fosaka's charm uh, which are also you know usually slightly decadent and uh, tragic as well as charming um, so we have this Heta Uma figure black haired clown and I've originally he's eating ramen but he looks a bit astonished a bit tragic somehow a bit um, disturbed as clowns are, are wont to do and uh, so I kind of digitally altered him and made made him into a, a character who's looking at his earlier self. Actually, it's also referring <laughs> in an unlikely moment's reference to Black Sabbath's Volume 4 album, because I like the typeface. This, it's a bit like Cable, which I use a lot in these podcasts or these vlogs. For instance, on the um, Isivu album, it's Cable typeface. It was a German sort of block typeface reminiscent of the 1920s and the Weimar Republic, which is why I like it. Posters, you know, from the Weimar Republic. But um, volume four is a typeface which is based on the, I think, maybe hand-drawn um, type used on uh, Black Sabbath volume four, which I actually listened to. I was in the bath listening to it on this iPad, thinking, hey, this is not bad. It's not at all the kind of music that I like, but it does have an, a primal energy with Ozzy Osbourne singing, you know, a very good voice for that kind of music. And um, each track has a kind of power, you know, and... Um, a kind of animal energy, which I guess my music doesn't have. My music's a bit more cerebral and detached and uh, gentle. Um, but I like the I liked the typography. Anything looks good with that seventies blocky, retro twenties sort of Art Deco kind of typeface. So and also I I, I copied the arrangement which has um, Black Sabbath up the side and then Volume Four 
across the top. So it's a, it's a double CD. Uh, you can pre-order it now from Darla, from darla.com, the website. And uh, it's also available on Bandcamp. You can download it uh, on Bandcamp. The double CD is because it's, uh, in physical format, incorporating um, 20 Frisky Whiskies, which was originally going to be just a Bandcamp-only compilation. I wanted to test out Bandcamp, and I, I was very pleasantly surprised by being able to earn a little money. Thank you, everybody who bought that and who's buying the current one on Bandcamp. That's really helping me to be Momus and to exist, to eat, uh, to walk around and go to fashionable third wave cafes in Paris. <laughs> Buy me a coffee. Isn't there a, there's a, like a website called uh, buymeacoffee.com or something where you can donate as well. No, not to me though. I'm not using that. But um, yeah, do, do buy the music. I mean, it, it makes a, a big difference. Um, so yeah, that's some, um, I was trying to find, I, 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 I need to go back to that station and try and find whose mural that was in Alma Marceau station. Um, I photographed half of some kind of credit. Uh, it seemed to say, um, Amour Harton. So I think, I think I chopped off the beginning of those words. It might be La, L'Amour uh, Horton or something like that. But, um, thank you. This, um, mosaic artist or carrelage, uh, Mirai artist uh, from the 80s, I imagine, from the 80s, who did uh, this trompe l'oeil thing in the corridor of that metro. I'm, I'll go and find out who it is. I always, I, I sort of fixate on details like that. I get fascinated by the stories behind the unsung artists who kind of make our daily lives better. You know, when you're walking down a metro corridor and you see a strange mural giving you a kind of false perspective into an imaginary world, I always like that, especially if the colours are well chosen. Um, I changed the colours a bit on this one. It was a bit beigey before. Um, I've made it uh, well, a series of different colours, actually, because on the CDs themselves, it's also different. So I actually went back today to the station Franklin D. Roosevelt on the Nine Line and um, looked at this uh, mosaic, which is apparently signed to D. D'Amour and P. Charton. Um, the internet does not know these people. Uh, I th assume it's from the 80s. It looks like an 80s uh, mural. And it has lots of uh, trompe l'oeil and uh, sort of depth suggested by very, by very flat things. The tiles themselves are very flat, but they manage with cunning um, diagonal lines across them and different colours to suggest uh, quite a bit of depth. So that appealed to me, the, the paradox of the flatness and the depth. So that's pretty much it. Um, Probably a, a short one today, just uh, telling you about the release. It is a semi-released album now, very quickly released. I think the official release date for the CD is April 26th, which somebody tells me is the same day as the Pet Shop Boys new album. So I, I go back to being the third Pet Shop Boy or a competitor, a kind of um, like a fake PG Tips <laughs> version of the Pet Shop Boys, the PSB Tips. I'll leave you with that. Fascinating thought, and uh, see you next time. Open University. This is BBC Two. Now, Bob Harris introduces this week's edition of the Old Grey Whistle Test. Nö, zum